Actually, um, I do work here. I brought the sign that said, time's up. Um, thank you, Leonard. <laughs> Always great to see you. Um, Jackass is a movie that's still kind of cool. I watched it a couple weeks ago. And uh, it's a great movie. And I had an epic limo ride with Steve-O and Wee Man uh, once, back when we were all drinking, 10 years ago. Uh, Brandon Novak is a cast, was a cast member of Jackass. Now he's an international skateboarding star. My son loves him. And New York Times best-selling author, ladies and gentlemen, Brandon Novak. Statistics state, theoretical evidence dictates that I am to be high or dead right now. The fact that I'm not is A, miraculous, equaling miracle, and B, it defies logic. The reality is the disease of addiction does not discriminate. From Yale or jail, the White House or the outhouse, the results are all the same, and one out of five people will be affected. My mother is a nuclear physicist on the board of Mercy Hospital. Just retired last year, 53 years of gainful employment, second longest employer in Mercy Hospital history. My brother today currently resides in the White House as a lawyer practicing pensions and benefits. My father died as a direct result of the disease of addiction. Me, on the other hand, at the age of seven years old, I got my first skateboard. And that night when my mother put me to bed, she said, Brandon, what do you want me to do with the skateboard? I said, I want it in bed with me. She said, why? I said, because if I die, I want it to come with me. It was like God had came down and handed me the holy ground in the form of a skateboard. I ate it, I breathed it, I slept it, I dreamt it. At 16, I was designing my pro model for Pal Peralta. At 14, I was the first skateboarder ever in the world to be endorsed by Gatorade. They were flying me out to Chicago to the Quaker Oats building. They'd put me on one treadmill and Michael Jordan on another treadmill. And they'd put wires in our noses and down our throats and give us each Gatorade to see the effects that it has on different sports players. At 16, I was on one of my first skateboarding tours. And uh, I got caught with a lot of drugs and alcohol. They said, get rid of the drugs or get off the tour. I threw the drugs down the sewer. After the demo, I met a girl, she drove me back, I fished the drugs out of the store. Long story short, I get caught, I get kicked off. I get a phone call from my mentor, a fellow by the name of Tony Hawk. He said, Brandon, we have two options we could do with you. We could put you into treatment, you could save your life, and you can continue to be a professional skateboarder, or you can quit the team. I didn't have a breath of fresh air in my lungs when I said I quit. I'm the kind of alcoholic that I tend to shy away from the words that rely, uh, the sentences that, uh, that depend upon being honest, reliable, or dependable because they do not help me get one more. And you'll hear in my story, anything between me and that bag, bottle, and pill must and will go, and it's not personal, it's just business, right? So now uh, I'm living at home at my mother's house. I'm an IV heroin addict. Uh, I've turned down the opportunity to go to treatment on the faith of Tony Hawk, and uh, about two weeks into this process, my mother comes to me, and she said, Brandon, we have a great idea for you. I said, what's that? She said, we want you to go to treatment. I thought about it for a second, and I said, that's phenomenal. A, I have the time, right? And B, I'm going to report to said treatment center. I'm going to report back to those two why I'm not you people, nor will I ever be. Overreaction at best. You caught me at a bad time on a bad way in a bad day. And I go into this first treatment center at the age of 17 in the heart of Baltimore City. And uh, it's 1030 at night. They put me in this big cafeteria. I'm ill as a research monkey. And out of nowhere, this older black gentleman walks up to me and he said, white boy, what are you doing here? I said, heroin. He said, how old are you? I said, 17. He said, do yourself a favor. Don't turn 18 in a place like this. You know what I can tell you about that gentleman? I can tell you where the four teeth were placed in his mouth because at the time I had all mine. Mind you, closed mind and closed heart, comparing out why I'm not you people, nor will I ever be. He was 70 to 75, I'm 17, he's black, I'm white, he smokes crack, my delusional mind says I successfully do heroin. He's homeless, I live with my mother and my girlfriend. God help that man, thank God he's found his path to freedom. Further ensuing, I am not that. You know what I can't tell you about that treatment center? I can't tell you my therapist's name. I can't tell you about the relapse prevention packet they're shoving down my throat. The healthier, unhealthy boundaries are trying to instill me because if I could tell you those things, that might mean that I can relate to being one of you people and I want no part. I leave that treatment center disease untreated, no defense against me and that first drink or drug. 
And you know what? I didn't turn 18 in that facility. But I'll tell you what. I turned 21, 22, 23, 25, 26, 27, 29, 30, 32, 33, 34, 35 in a jail or a treatment center. And every year on my birthday, I would think back to that crazy old gentleman and say, maybe if I, me, myself, Brandon Novak, would have listened to that man, I would not find myself in this situation year after year after year. Fully self-induced, meaning that I had created or painted this picture for which I lived in. Right? And see, I would go to these meetings, I would go to these meetings, and what I would do is I would come around and I would loiter with the intent to recover. Right? I thought I could get through osmosis from between her legs or from your pocketbook. So I would get a sponsor, I would get a home group, I would fellowship because I'm a people person, but you say work the steps, whoa, 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 fucking take it easy. (laughs) Take it easy. Take it easy. And then for the life of me, I can't figure out how I've ended up back on the corner of Eastern Avenue in Patterson Park selling my ass for $40. How did I get here? I did not stick my hand up in seventh grade and said, I want to be a homeless heroin addict in Baltimore City selling my body. Mother nuclear physicist, brother attorney in the White House, lived with a cautionary tale. My father, I said, I will never be him. I hate him. I hate drugs and alcohol because I see what it makes him do to me, to my brother, to my mother, to my sister. Never. Right? Now, in between these times, I'm in and out of treatment centers and see, I see it works for you people, but it cannot work for me because I'm in too internally unique. You haven't seen what I've seen. You haven't experienced what I've experienced. You didn't have to watch your father cut your mother's throat at the age of seven. Your father didn't take you to the strip joint. When he went in the back to conduct business, they put me on the stool and the barkeeper pour me shots of ginger ale and Coca-Cola. And as I would do those shots, they would applaud. My father would give me that look of approval. You people didn't end up in these movies later on down the line that afforded me the opportunity to break a lot of bones. And when I would go into the hospital and say, hey, this is that guy from the movies. He can't be an addict. And they're very generous with the script pads. So now I trip and I fall into these movies called Jackass, right? I'm traveling the world. I'm doing things that people equate to success or happiness and some even dream of doing, yet I can't keep a needle out of my arm. And let me tell you why I can't, because Brandon only attends Brandon's Anonymous. Brandon only sponsors Brandon, and Brandon is Brandon's God. And now I can't understand how my mother had to go buy me a plot nine years ago on Mother's Day. How did I get here? This is not my intentions. I'm no fool by any means. The disease of addiction does not discriminate. So now I come up with a foolproof plan how I'm going to beat my act of addiction, and I mean it. Strap me up to a polygraph. I will pass with flying colors. I'll have every police officer pat me on the back saying, Mr. Novak, we wish everyone could be as honest as you. I'm going to move to Helsinki, Finland. It's across the world. They don't even speak my language. I can go there. I can regroup. I can rebrand. I can reassess. I can reevaluate. I can redo life, and I'm going to do it. At a young age, my mother said, show me who you walk with and I'll tell you who you are. And that carried over to social acceptability equal personal recovery. And what I didn't understand then that I understand now is I was trying to fill this internal void with an external solution. So I get to Finland and I go to this five-star hotel and I go right to the lobby bar and there's all these businessmen in expensive suits and they're having meetings and I go right to the pub and I order a bottle of wine. I meet a girl at the bar, she gives me a phone number, I'm having bags of heroin delivered to me and I called my sponsor Lex and I said, Lex, how did this happen? It was not supposed to be this way. He said, let me tell you something, Mr. Know-it-all. I guess you skimmed over the part where we talked about geographical change does not equal recovery. I guess you also missed over the part where we said... I guess you also skimmed over the part where we said, oh, man, this takes me back. I'm sorry. I guess you also skimmed over the part where we said that, uh, that, uh, that I have no defense against me in that first drink or drug. Left to my own devices, I will drink. They say, you can't shake your shadow. You take you with you everywhere you go. And they talk about what triggers are. My triggers are when my eyelids open. I will go shoot dope with this microphone until I get tired of carrying this microphone. And guess what? When I get tired of carrying it, it doesn't matter because my disease says you don't have the privilege to drop the microphone. How did I get here? How did I get here? Now, my delusional alcoholic mind says the jackass world needs me. It cannot go on without me. I am an asset. In reality, it, went, it did not need me. It went on quite fine without me. And I'm a liability. I'm the last person to know that because I know everything. I know everything. Right? Because they say if we book him the flight, will he make the flight? Let's say we book him the flight and he makes the flight, will he, what condition will he be when he gets here? And let's say we book him the flight and he makes the flight, are we going to have to kick the bathroom door down at Paramount Studios and find him dead on the ground with a needle in his arm? 
Now, at this point, people have taken life insurance policies out on me. My mother's bought me a plot. I've been medevaced to four different states from four different overdoses to four different hospitals. How did I get here? Now I come up with a new plan. I got to reinvent myself. Internal void, external solution. I decide I'm going to write a book. Now I'm doing all this with, while drinking and drugging. Uh, uh, I have no high school diploma. Later on down the line, I got my GED in prison. And the only reason why I took my GED and passed it in prison was because, A, I had the time. And, B, if you pass the GED in the joint, you got a pizza party supplied by Domino's. So I don't know about anybody else in here, but that's a no-brainer. But here's the hit. I aced that GED like I was a Harvard graduate. Straight A's. And here's why I aced it. Because it was my idea. See, because I possess this job that entails me of knowing everything. So when you tell me what I need to do, I tell you why you need to F off. But all of a sudden, I want to take this GED. I want this pizza party. I excel at a rapid pace, and I ace it like a Harvard grad. The reason why I did so bad for so many years in so many treatment centers, so many doctors, offices, AA, NA, is because it wasn't my idea. If it was my idea, I would have excelled at a rapid pace and been a billboard for every treatment, every AA meeting, every NA meeting. But you tell me what I need to do, I tell you I need to F off. So I decide I'm going to write this book. This book's an autobiography addiction memoir. I write this book, the book gets published. The book gets published, it becomes a New York Times seller. I'm now receiving hundreds of thousands of pieces of mail from all over the world. Of people like you saying, Novak, I read your book. I did want my story to get as bad as yours. I have 30 days. Of people like you saying, saying uh, I read your book. I understand why my daughter picks the needle over coming to have dinner with me on the weekends. It's not because I was a bad mom. It's because she suffers from the disease of addiction. My delusional alcoholic mind said, I just wrote the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I believe it. I'm at my book release in Times Square in New York City. I have my literary agent there, my manager's there, the publisher's there, all these well-to-do people in the scholarly world, but I don't have any dope that day. And my people will not give me any money for any dope that day because it would not be a good look me sitting at this table autographing autobiography addiction memoir while falling asleep due to heroin. Right? But the funny thing is, that's not the funny thing. Is The funny thing is, is I can't say to my disease, hey, give me two hours. I got to work. I don't have the privilege to do that. I don't have the privilege. So when they wheel my books in, me and my buddy from Baltimore are sitting there. I, and we take one look at each other and we have that language of the heart. And we stand up. I grab two boxes of my books. He grabs two boxes of my books. And we leave the book signing, we go right to the Amtrak train station, jump on the train, go back to Baltimore, and I autograph and sign them to do different stores and go buy more heroin. I'm now stealing my own books from my book release signing on addiction to sell to go buy more heroin. Right now, at this point, I've been in 13 inpatient treatment centers. I've lost count of outpatients and detoxes. My mother's bought me a plot, people taking life insurance policies, and I just woke up from life support in seven days. I walk into my 13th inpatient treatment center with the clothes on my back. My worldly possessions consist of eight scarves, two jackets, three socks, one stick of deodorant. How did I get there? And it all fits into a bag that doubles as a pillow. My mother's a nuclear physicist. My brother's an attorney in the White House. Former professional skateboarder, New York Times selling author, been in movies that break box office records, millionaire three times over between the ages of 23, 24. I'm at a position now where I'm the kind of alcoholic I want to kill myself on a daily basis, but I don't want to hurt myself in the process. I'm horrible at suicide because I keep waking up. I'm at a point where I'm so low the curb looks like a skyscraper. And I was literally at this point in time demoralized in just such a fashion from drugs and alcohol, beaten into a state of reasonableness that I did was I walked in and I had the same intake woman and I've seen her four previous times and the conversation would go like this. Okay, Mr. Novak, your insurance covers 90 days. And I'd say in theory that sounds great, but in reality I'm more of like a 45-day kind of fella. Haven't you seen my resume? I can make things happen. And she laugh at me each and every time and say, sweetheart, I'm so sorry for you because anything and everything you put in front of your recovery does not or will not matter. You will lose it. Ignorance was no longer bliss. I remember her telling me that. Now I have to be held accountable for my actions, and I don't like to do that. I shoot dope when I become uncomfortable, right? So now... My mother has resorted to one last Hail Mary. She went to Father Mike across the street at the church, and Father Mike said, Miss Pat, how's Brandon? He said, she's never been worse. I've, I've sold three homes to financially pay for him to go to treatment. I've depleted several savings accounts. So I've simply went to God with one prayer, and Father Mike said, oh, yeah, Miss Pat, what's that prayer consist of? She said, it's real simple, Father Mike. It goes like this. God, please cure him, kill him, or kill me because I can't take it anymore. And for the first time ever, Father Mike looked at my mother and said, how dare you, Miss Pat? Don't you ever go to God with a prayer like that. God has a plan for your son. Little do you know what it is. I don't know what it is. And Brandon definitely doesn't know what it is. And thank God I didn't know what it was because I would have fucked it up. 
I would have gotten the way of it. When it said make a left, I would have made a right. And I also learned when I want to make my God laugh, I tell him how my day is going to go. Beaten into that state of reasonableness. I successfully complete this 90-day treatment center. I'm way over time. They've been complaining in the back about time. So I got to wrap up a 25-year drug log in like zero minutes, five minutes ago. And, uh, and, and I successfully complete the 90-day treatment center. I go to a sober living house for one year. Um, my mother, the same woman that had a restraining order served against me, she called me one year into my process. She said, Brandon, I hate when you come to visit. I said, why? She said, because I get so sad when you leave. That book deal that I had, I got the, the contract here it tore up because I stole my own books. Uh, my last book came out nine months ago. I have three more books coming out. I have the first ever addiction graphic novel coming out. I have a documentary going to the Sundance and the Cannes Film Festival. This is not me bragging or boasting. This is me simply saying the disease of addiction does not discriminate. But this is also me saying sobriety has given me everything that drugs and alcohol promised me. My name's Brandon. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Brandon.